Welcome to United Body of Christ Church, an online ministry where it is our mission to minister and feed the Word of God to the body of Christ. Visit our website at ubcchurch.org where we offer free full-length video and audio Bible study lessons taught verse by verse. Select a speaker, topic, or series and click filter to view the Bible lesson of your choice. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow along with each verse by scrolling to the bottom of each Bible study video. If you are in need of prayer, you can visit our website and fill out the prayer request form. Please be sure to indicate if you would like your name added to our online prayer list page. And most importantly, please indicate if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We also ask that you visit the prayer list and pray for our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Last but not least, the United Body of Christ app is available in the Google Play Store and your iPhone app store. Let us now join Pastor Clarence for today's Bible study lesson. Well, God bless you, saints, citizens, and soldiers of the Most High God. My name is Clarence, and I'm pastor of United Body of Christ Church, which is an online ministry. So on behalf of my family and myself, we'd like to take this opportunity to welcome, to welcome your families, to welcome yourselves back to another broadcast, back to another Bible study. Today we are coming at you with Revelation chapter 16 and 17. A lot of information for us to kind of get into and discern and, and disseminate, if you will, to try to get some understanding as to what's happening here. So pretty interesting. I'm looking forward to getting into it with you. As always, we like to uh, start our lessons out by going before the Lord in prayer. Amen. Our Father, thou art in heaven, and hallowed be thy name. Thine kingdom comes, thine will be done upon this earth as your will is done in heaven. Give unto us this day our daily bread, Father, we ask that you would forgive us of our sins. We ask that you would forgive us of our transgression. Father, forgive us of our debts. We ask that you would pardon our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the hands of the evil one. Your majesty, lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forevermore. It's in Jesus' name in which we pray. Father, we come before you this day having bowed down heads and humbled hearts, a reverence, a adoration for you, even the fear of you, O oh God, because you are and you will be as you have always been. You are God and you are God all by yourself. There is none greater than you there is none more powerful than you. There is none that is in all place at all times. There is none who, who knows all things as you do, Father. There is none like you. None can be measured or compared to you. You are indeed the beginning and the end. You are tried and true, and you are from everlasting to everlasting. You are the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. There is nothing that you have not seen, and there is nothing that you have not heard. You know the intents of men. You know the past, the present, and the future. For you alone have orchestrated the steps of the world, the turning of it, the rotation of it, all the details of man's life. You have orchestrated. You alone knows 
the strands of hair upon the heads of men, the attentions of the hearts of men. There is nothing that your eyes have not seen, and there is nothing that your ears have not heard. So we acknowledge you. You are great, and you are powerful. You are mighty, and you alone are God. You are the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. He is your only begotten Son, and he is our high priest. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And he is the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords. He is the king of righteousness. He saved us because you've allowed him to do so. He washed us with his blood because you allowed his blood to be shed on our behalf. So for this, we say thank you to you, all most high God. And we say thank you to your only begotten son, our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for all that you've done and continue to do. You allowed our eyes to awaken this day. And you allowed our hearts to long for you, to draw near to you to feed ourselves with light, with truth, and with word. And so here we are, asking and hoping, Father, to please you with our faith, that our faith may be made stronger. Father, that we would overcome, that we may come over. Father, we're striving to draw nearer. Father, to, to withstand the wiles of the devil. This is our desire, O oh God, that we may have a better understanding even of your word, and that as we, as we have considered the days and the times and have, have concluded, Father, indeed that we are in these last days, help us to stand strong, to stand in courage and a good cheer, above all and moreover, that we are not amongst those that have fallen away. Yea, God, those that we may draw nigh to you every moment of every day. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ, Father, that we always have a desire to please you, to seek your face. And Father, that we would, that we would dis restrain ourselves from those things in this world that would draw us away. This is our desire, Father, that we stay in the midst of thee, that your arms would stay around us and that we would allow it to be so and not resist you, but resist those things that bring forth distractions. This is our desire, Father. You'll know, so now, Father, here we are. Here we are seeking your face. Here we are, Father seeking your ways that we may apply them. Here we are, Father, that we may know thy word, that we may live according to his instructions, according to the revelation of it, Father, that we may apply it, its understanding to our lives, O oh God, that we may have understanding and gain knowledge of your word and of the days and the times in which we live. By. So have your way in this Bible study. Have your way, Father. Help us to understand that which we read. Help us to rightfully divide your word in truth. This is our desire, Father. And I thank you for the opportunity to declare your truths. I thank you for the opportunity to draw near. Above all and moreover, I thank you for the opportunity to repent. For you have not given us up, O oh God. But your arms are wide open, just as your heart. Your grace and mercies have pleaded the case for us, individually and collectively, Father. So we thank you. We look forward to your presence every day. Have your way, Father. And we thank you for this opportunity to draw near, to be fed and satisfied. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.
I'm grateful to come before you this day to have an opportunity to to preach, to to share the word of God, Amen. To uh, to to learn, because just as you're taking it in and learning, we are too. So I bless God for the opportunity to even be in this position, Amen. As always, God is the chef, the bread that He has prepared for us to break and receive. It's the word of God, the bread of life. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the bread. He is the way, the truth, the life. He is the word. We also take this opportunity to acknowledge the Holy Spirit. It's the reason why you have a desire to draw near to God. It's the reason why you have a desire to please him. It's the reason why you want to be saved, why you want to be cleansed, why you want to overcome your struggles. Because the Spirit of God dwells inside of you, and he gives you a desire for the Lord by strengthening your spirit man. And as your spirit man becomes stronger, it wants to draw closer to that which has brought it to life, which is God himself. Amen? And so the Holy Ghost working inside of you, invigorating your spirit, man, giving you an appetite to draw near, giving you an appetite to live holy and to disdain from unrighteousness. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the way it works inside of us individually and collectively. And it's doing so because God has allowed it to be. So that's our way of acknowledging the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I take this opportunity to acknowledge my wife, who is my better half, if you will, the other half, the better half. She is the one that God has allowed me to marry and to make her a wife, his daughter, and that the love of God flows through her as she embraces our family and myself. So I bless God to be in the comfort of her love and that he would share his goodness upon me through the love of my wife. Uh, and so I, I, I take this opportunity to just acknowledge all that God has done for us and me. Amen. Any understanding that you receive from this lesson, it's because God has allowed it to, to be so. My wife and I, our job is to serve. It's, it's, but it's God who makes it so that you can partake of what it is that he's prepared for us. It's him that opens up your understanding, that opens up your knowledge, that allows you to, to retain. He, he opens up knowledge, he opens up understanding, and he allows you to retain the information. He allows you to make sense out of it. And then the blessed thing about it is the natural man cannot receive the things of God. They're foolishness to him. But for us, because we are spiritual, we, 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 we are already on, on, on solid ground in being able to understand the word of God because we're not considered natural. We're considered spiritual. Amen? So I wanted to share that with you, our, our way of, of honoring the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Uh, we'll get right into it. Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord our God. So let's get into it. Revelation chapter 16, let's start at verse 1. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials and that, that, that word vials, vials, it translates to, to the bowls. Bowl. So we, if you ever hear the term bowl judgments, that's what the vials are. They're considered bowl judgments. So go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Now, this is interesting here. Now, this is interesting here. Look at what this look at what the verse says here in the end. Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Hold your place there and go with me to First Thessalonians chapter five, verse nine. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse nine. Now, take a look at this. 
Actually, let's back up to verse 8. We'll read verse 8 and verse 9. But let us who are of the day be sober, put it on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. So we don't, the, the enemy is going to try to tell you that you're not good enough, that you won't be spared, that you, you'll never be able to measure up. He'll, and, and he'll try to get inside of your head, right? And so what he's trying to do is he's trying to put you in fear so that your that faith that God has gifted you with won't prevail because you, you've, you've, you've extinguished faith with fear. So he tries to get in your head and then come and then try to take down the defense, the defenses of your faith by contaminating you with fear. And so once that happens, you begin to question if, if you can live up, if you can measure up. And it's all, de it's all designed to get you to give up. So, now look at verse 9 here. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's so the enemy knows that he will perish. He's trying to take as many as he can with him. And he just can't, he just can't steal your salvation from you, meaning that he can't, he can't send you to hell. He don't have that power. But he can try to persuade you to give up. He can try to persuade you to give in. He'll try to get inside of your head so that he can wear down the defenses of your faith and get you to live according to fear. And when that starts happening, when you start living by fear and not walking by faith, then you become carnal. And it's in your carnality that you find yourself in danger because man can't please God without faith. So it's through carnality, through your natural state, that you find because the, the, the natural man can inherit the kingdom of God. And it's through carnality that you find yourself in danger of, of being a candidate of the wrath of God. So look at this again, rereading verse 9. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we, we constantly got to block we, we got to cast down uh, uh, thoughts and, and, and evil, evil thoughts and wicked imaginations. We got to cast that stuff down. You know, we have to listen to the spirit of God speaking. We can't entertain what the media tells us, what's happening on Twitter. You know, all of those things are there to incite you, to keep, to, to get you to be uh, forged in carnality to get you to walk in hate, right? All of those things, that's how the devil begins to transition you from spiritual to natural, to get you to, to, to uh, abide in, 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 in hate and not love. See, hate sees differences between the people. Hate sees color and prejudice and racistness. And racist. It focuses on that and it makes you unforgiving, right? You don't walk in love when you walk in stuff like that. And you, you'll you call yourself being somewhat uh, uh, of a policeman, of, 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 of making sure that there isn't any racial disparity. But before you know it, you find yourself breaking the law of racism while you're trying to accuse others of it. You're not walking in love, right? That's, that's how it is. And and that's how the enemy brings down. And that's just one example. That's how the enemy brings you in to transition you into a state of carnality, tries to get you to not walk in love, but to get you to walk in hate, to get you to doubt, bring down your faith so that you can start living according to fear. And all of this is because he's trying to get you to be appointed to the wrath of God, just like he is. And it always starts from somewhere. It always starts somewhere, and, and it's always fueled by these things are that these distractions which are out here. Amen. So we wanted to, to, to show you that 
in scriptures that that God has not chosen you to to be a consumer of his wrath. It's those that have rebelled and rejected him. Those that have rebelled against him and rejected his son. Those are the ones that are appointed to wrath. But because God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, he does everything he can to show you how much he loves you and to get you to prevail against the enemy, against the wicked one. He, does, he pulls out every stop. But at the end of the day, the, the true love is allowing us to decide if we want to love him in return. He can't force it. Just like the enemy can't force you to go against God, he can only persuade you. So God does what he can to persuade you. God persuades you through love. The enemy persuades you through deception. Amen? So here we are, Revelation 16. So we know that the angel begins to pour out the wrath of God. And those that are, are the recipients of it are those that have chosen to go against the Lord. So they are the ones that are appointed to the wrath. Okay? So verse 2. The first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. That lets you know who the candidates of the wrath of God, you know, who they are. Those that, again, that have rejected God. Those, remember we read about those, I think it was in chapter 13, about the, the, the mark of the beast, and that you couldn't buy, sell, or trade unless you, you have the mark of the beast and you worship this image, you know, and, 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 and you ha or you have the number of his name and you worship this image. It's those, they, and remember what God did? He sent out the angels. One of them are, 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 was preaching the gospel and telling men to fear God. And this, one of the other angels was warning people not to take the beast, um, to, excuse me, not to take the mark, rather, which is the same, not to take the beast, not to take the mark. The angel was warning people. A third one was, was another angel was broadcasting how Babylon was, was, was judged, it was going to be judged. But God was telling people then, through the angels, pulling out every stop, don't take the mark. And those that chose to, 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 to turn a blind eye and a deaf ear to what the angels were saying, you know, those are the ones that, that, that the, the, the wrath of God has been appointed to. So this is what we're reading about. So the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as, as the blood of dead men, of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. So every living soul, every living soul that was in the sea, whether it was fishes, uh, sea, sea creatures, sea life in the sea, or, or, or even the men, they died. So we know the, the, first, the first bowl of God's wrath brought boils upon men, which is kind of reminiscent, uh, reminiscent to what was happening in Egypt when God began to judge Egypt. So the, the, you had these boils that, that, that began to pop up on men, and they were so painful. They, they, were, they were painful. And that men began to live in torment because of these boils, these blisters that started to appear on them. Okay? So then all of a sudden, the, God pours out his wrath into the sea, and all of this, the, the sea became blood. Right. But we, we're going to find out why he turned the seas into blood. So the third angel poured out his bowl upon the rivers and the fountains of water and they became blood. And watch this here. It, it becomes that you start to hear this in verse five and six of why it happened. And I heard the angel of the water say, thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shall be. Because thou hast judged thus, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. So see, that's why he did it, 
right? Because God remembered. If we go back to Revelation chapter 6, let's, let's jump back there real quick. Revelation chapter 6. And look, look at, uh, let's see. Yeah, look at verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, doest thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So now, all of a sudden, here it comes. God is like, God was trying to make sure that he had, he gave men every opportunity to repent. Right. Even even those that didn't go up into uh, uh, up from the rapture, those that were still on the earth that had to go through tribulation. God was still doing everything he could to save them from their sins. Right. To try to persuade them to choose him. But once but but there comes a time to where the choice have, have, they have already made the choice and it's time to let it commence. And so when you start to see the waters turn bloody, right? All the waters turn bloody. God is saying, hey, remember the blood you shed of my children? All that blood you shed? Here's, let me give you, let me show you what you did, right? And so God begins to turn the waters to blood. God is saying, all the, all the blood shed of my children over the age of men, that this, that the satanic system, this, this darkened kingdom has shed over all my children. I've remembered it. And here is the blood that I held to, to, to let you know that I was keeping record of what you've done. And that's what the angel is saying here. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets. And thou hast given them blood to drink. For they are worthy. Right? So God remembered. He kept, and, and so when, it, when, when those that were martyred in the tribulation, they, they asked God, when will you avenge us? This is like the enemy keeps getting away with, with doing things to us. When are you going to avenge us? Well, finally, God lays down the hammer on them, right? So it's pretty interesting here. So everything begins to, all the waters, the seas and the rivers, the fountains of water, everything begins to turn to blood. And it be, it's, it's twofold there. It's a double-edged sword because one is God letting them know that, that all this blood that you shed, look at this. This is the blood that you've shed, and I, I've, I've kept this blood to make sure that it be a witness to you as of, as of what you did to my children. Number two, you can't drink the water because it's blood. It's bloody. It's poison. You can't drink it, right? So you so now you're going to... You, you, if it, People that were holding out hope, you know, that, that they can get through the tribulation and still live with the with the with the, the this this darkened beast, right? Still live in unrighteousness and you you gotta have water. You gotta have resources if you think you was gonna endure, you know, the wrath of God. Well, God starts to shut off the springs of water, make them he contaminated them, right? So pretty interesting there. I digress. Let's continue. For they shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink. For they are worthy. They deserve it, is what the angels say. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And this is pretty interesting because what you're having is, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that God is remorseful in the sense to say that maybe God would have repented for what he's done as far as his, his wrath on man. But what you'll have, what, what you're having is the angels um, solidifying uh, uh, God's decision to pour out his wrath. It was like the angels are, are it's, it's almost like they're encouraging, Lord, you're doing right. You're, you're, you are righteous to do what you're doing to do what you're doing to them because look at what they have done to you over all the ages over the course of humanity look at what they've done to you so you're right and you're just in what you're doing to them you've long suffered with them uh, uh, you, you you've endured with them you've tried to counsel them you've done nothing but have been good to them 
So you're doing right. You're just in what you're doing. It's, it's, it's like they're encouraging God. Not that God needed the encouragement, but they're there and letting them know that you're right in what you're doing. We are a witness to the way they have been towards you and your son, Jesus, who is the Christ. We've been a witness over the course of humanity about how they turned on you, how they forsook you, how they cursed you. We've saw it. You know, so you're right in what you do to them. So that's real interesting as I read this here. Real interesting. And God is just, he's, he's a merciful and a compassionate God. So I wouldn't be, not for me to read too much in the scripture, I wouldn't be uh, um, surprised if, if, if God did have some reservation about man. I'm, you know, because do you remember when, when God sent the angel, uh, remember when David took a census and and um, God let David know you messed up when you did that, you know? And, and so uh, David took a census of the children of Israel as though that they were his. And God told him, you, you're going to have to choose your punishment on this one. And so ultimately God sent the, the angel uh to wreak havoc on, on, on the children of Israel. And he was doing such a job that God had to intervene and say, it's enough. He had to pull the angel back. That's that mercy and compassion of the father. He's just a merciful and a compassionate God. But enough is enough, right? That's everyone's, everyone gets to that. And God is no exception. You know, his grace and his mercy you know, at, at some point in time, man got to be held accountable. And that's what the angels are saying, that they're being held account, accountable for what they've done. Okay? Let's go on here because we, we've got a lot to cover. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his bowl or his vial upon the sun. And power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. Now, this is huge because in our world right now, we'll have people to say global warming or, or now they, they just say climate change, right? Because you can't go from when, when things, you can't say global warming and then all of a sudden, in the winters, the, the, and, and sometime in the summers, things get so cool, you know, you, you can't keep saying, you know, global warming because stuff start cooling down. So the next thing you have to say is climate change. And, you know, and of course, you know, you'll see different storms and the impact of these storms, you know, the consistency of them. And so man says, we got to do something. We got to do something. We, we got to pull back the emissions. We got to do this because this will save us. But according to the Bible, <laughs> according to the book, man's efforts must be in vain because the sun lit these jokers up. <laughs> well, um, let's read that again. The angel, the fourth angel poured out his bowl or the wrath of God upon the sun. And power was given unto him to scorch man with fire. So that sun heated up the planet so much that it, <laughs> there was nothing man could do. It's no legislation that he passed. The only legislation that man could have passed that would have saved him, that he would have been a, a, a appointed to this wrath, is that all would, would turn their hearts towards God and repent so that the land, so that God would hear our prayers and that he, he would hear from heaven and then that he, he would heal our lands, right? That's the only legislation that man would have passed to be able to, to turn things around or at least to keep him from being the one appointed to the wrath of God because <laughs> all, any legislation that he passes to try to curb our emissions. I don't care how many electric cars that he put out there so that he's not burning fossil fuels so that it's not going to help 
The sun is going to light it up when the time comes. The sun is going to play a part uh, uh, in, 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 in getting man's houses in the order, so to speak. And this, it's divine to read this because it's like, man, you know that man's efforts is in vain. You know, so what do you do with that? So I find that real interesting here. So uh, <laughs> this is that you got to think it is going to get so hot that the rays from the sun, you're already dealing with blisters, right? Wrath of God. This is bottom line, wrath of God. And, and then there is no, there is, n atheism is gone, <laughs> right? We've talked about that in the Bible study before. Man knows exactly what's happening. He's already encountered the beast, the, the satanic kingdom. He's already made his choice. And it's, it's, it's up to no illusion. It's, it, there is no illusions of what begins to happen to man. Right? It, and and what's, what's so powerful about it is that the choice that he made in the enemy he chose the enemy rather than choose God. There is nothing that man could do. Oh, and let me put it like this. He looked towards the enemy to save him, right? Because he chose the enemy over God. And, and when these things begin to happen, the enemy don't save him. <laughs> the enemy is in trouble himself. It's what happened to the children of Egypt. When all of their idols, the Egyptians back in the day when, 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 when Egypt made Israel, as, when he made Israel slaves and God sent Moses in to, to pull them out, right? To get them out of their, 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 their slave, slavery camps. And when God judged Egypt, he judged their, their gods. He judged them based on all of these idols that they have because they thought that their idols and their religious system was the system of the world, that their gods were the gods of the world. And when God judged them, he brought their gods down. Everything that they began to worship according to their gods, their false gods, their idols, he lit all that up so that they, that they would know the truth, that there was only one true God. Well, God does the same here in, in, when, when he sends out his wrath. And he sends it out so that men, men have, they, they come into the understanding that they made the wrong choice. But by the time that they come into that understanding, their heart is hardened because they are, they've already made their minds up to hate God. But what they've done, God shows them that you made the wrong choice. But even in the end, they still resisted God even unto the death. But God lit them up before they died. They suffered before they died. But he, one of the things he did was let them know that the, that the enemy had no power over God. Once you, once you are, what did uh, Eli say? I think it was Eli in the Old Testament that says, who can save you once you fall into the hands of God? There no one can intercede for you. There is no one that can save you. It's, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. And the thing about it is, as they chose the enemy over God, the enemy could not save them from, from the wrath of God. Neither could he save himself. But even in that, man still chose the enemy until the end, right? So I wanted to put that out there. All the stock that they put in the enemy, you know, their, their condos and their, their, their bomb shelters, they use the system, the enemy system to, to all of that stuff won't save them. So I digress. Let's continue because this is, a, it, we got a lot to cover here. So verse nine, so men were scorched by great with great heat and they blasphemed the name of God that's what I'm saying even until their last breath God showed them that there is nothing that the enemy that you put over me won't be able to deliver you out of my hands right but even in that 
they still would not turn towards God. So they blasphemed the name of God, which had power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. Just powerful, right? It's, and the hardening of the heart. Do you remember with Egypt, when Egypt's council constantly told him, man, you need to let these children go. We're talking about the children of Israel. Egypt, the Pharaoh was being told by his council to let the children of Israel go. And then there was times that Pharaoh wanted to let them go, but then all of a sudden he would have a change of mind and be like, nah, I'm going to hold them just a little long. I'm going to hold them just a little long, just a little, a little bit longer, a little bit longer. And it got lit up, right? And as he was getting lit up, as he was getting lit up, he became determined in his mind, I ain't let nobody go. But the scripture says after that, God hardened his heart so that his mind would stay, that he was not, he, he, he made up his mind and God helped his mind to be made up because when he had an opportunity to let them go, he chose not to. And because he chose not to, God cemented his position. Okay, you're not going to change your mind? Fine, I'll see to it that your mind remains in, 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 in its decision. You know, I'll make it so that you won't change your mind. Since you had an opportunity to change it and you chose not to, I'll make it so that you don't repent over it, right? And so that's what happens here. Because they chose God, um, because they chose against God and they chose the enemy, God made it so that their position was stayed, right? So they, they, they didn't want to, they didn't want to repent or give him glory. And it made it so, it, it gives you an understanding as to what the angels were saying. When you back up and you look at what the angel says, look, look at verses, uh, verse six. For they shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And it's and the way that they begin to curse God, it helps you to understand, yeah, they're worthy. <laughs> yes, yeah, 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 you were right to get them. As a matter of fact, I don't understand why you didn't get them sooner. <laughs> that's, the, that's the consensus, right? That's what you see here. So it's really some heavy stuff going down here. But I digress because we got a lot to cover. So the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast and the kingdom was full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues for pain. So now the, 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 this enemy gets up, he comes out of the pit. It's this antichrist, right? He's got this false prophet, right? And then he this that and we're going to talk about this a little bit more in this in this broadcast here. He dies and he comes back. And it's thought to be such that this this the city or or yeah this kingdom dies and comes back into power as well. So you not only have the king of this kingdom dying and coming back but you also have the, the, the kingdom itself is brought back into power, the same as this beast. And so that, I, that's, I know that's a vague explanation of some things there, but, but kind of stay with me here. So when he comes back into power, after he dies and comes back, Satan himself takes over his vessel. And now what he does is he goes into um, the temple and sets, his, sets himself up in the temple. And he himself wants to be worshipped. And that's what you're really going to read about uh, uh, in, in chapter 17. How he, is, he no longer wants there, you know how we you got all of these idols and all of these uh, uh, various forms of, 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 of religion, right? Well, when he comes, when, when Satan assumes the vessel of this Antichrist, when he comes back, what happens is he's not going to want all of these. He, 
you know what what the Catholic Church is doing now? They 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 call it uh, ecumenical, which is we all serve the same God. It's just different paths to get there. It's not me. It's what they're saying there, right? This is what they're saying. So let's so let's all just come together under the umbrella of love and confusion. So the way you serve and worship him, the way you serve and worship him, the way you serve, let, let's just all, everybody get a car. Let's just all come together, right? That's, that's the way that the Catholics, they, they call it ecumenical when all of these different uh, views of faith come together. Well, when the enemy is in power, he will have none of that. <laughs> He's going, he, because that's part of the system. He's going to do away with the system and he himself will want to be worshipped. He is going to do away with all that. We'll read about that more in Revelation chapter 17. We're going to read about that more there. But when he comes into power, he will have none of that. All these different ways. He wants to make sure that he on this earth is as a God and wants to be worshiped as a God. And so during this wrath of God, God, the God allows the angel to pour out his wrath upon the throne of the enemy himself. So wherever the it's thought to be that he set up his throne in, in the temple, you know, meaning that they re, they rebuilt the temple and he goes in the temple because he wants to be worshiped as God on the earth. Not not the Babylonian idols or anything else. He himself wants to be known as this God of the world, right? So his throne gets attacked. The wrath of God is poured out upon his seat, okay, or his throne, okay? And his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. Who gnaw, Who's gnawing their tongue, and what pain are they in? These are they that took the, we, we got the answer to that in the, in the, in, in the, uh, the second verse here. And the first went and poured out his vial or his bowl upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped the image. So those, those people that chose the enemy over God, they're still in great pain. This is what you're reading about here. The fifth angel poured out his vial upon the throne of the beast and his kingdom was full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues for pain because they're walking around with these boils and the sun is lighting these jokers up. They're in pain. They're not seeing a quick death. They are suffering for having made, having chosen against God. Okay. And they blaspheme the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they repented not of their deeds. Okay? And this is, remember we started out by saying, you're not appointed to the wrath of God. You are not. You're not appointed. But the enemy is trying to rewrite that. He can't say, you're going to hell, you're going, he can't do that. But he's going to try to deceive you to take down your defenses, to get you to live by fear, to get you to take the mark, right? How many people, how many people got the, how many people got the jab because they were afraid of losing their job? The enemy wants you to be in fear because if you're in fear, you're not walking by faith. And that's a, the only way you should be in fear is be in fear of the living God. The wise, the only wise, true God. That's He's the only one you should fear, and you have to know that He'll take care of you. You know, no matter. You may have to give some things up because God is not going to take care of you on your terms. He takes care of you on His terms, and once you begin to understand that, then you you you're in a much better situation. But the enemy will get you to live, try to get you to live according to fear. And in a fearful state, you're in a in a carnal state, right? You're you becoming a natural man, and now all of a sudden, while you're in that fearful and carnal state, he can introduce you to more things because your defenses are down. Ultimately, he is trying to get you to choose his ways so that you can perish with him. That's the bottom line, right? So you're here watching this Bible study because 
you you don't want to perish with them. You want to reign with Christ Jesus. I do too. So that's what we're doing, right? So we're reading about those that chose not to reign with Christ. That's what, that's what we're reading about. And it's real interesting, right? So verse 12. So the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. And the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. So they're going to gather right there around Palestine. They're going to gather. They're going to try to make their way into Palestine, try to get to Jerusalem. They're going to try to get to Jerusalem itself. And in order to get there, you got to go through uh, the river Euphrates, right? Because of what whatever is happening, maybe there is an EMP. You can't land. There's maybe no ones or maybe no one is flying planes because of the war, because of the wars and rumors of wars. Maybe EMPs have devastated electronics. So now people are marching, right? And but you can't really get in there unless the 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 path is is dried up so that you can you can march over dry land. And so like a 200 million army, uh, 200 million man army begins to ascend upon Jerusalem. Right. And what and, and, and so God is expecting that. Right. So God is drawing them. right? So what he does is he dries up the river because God is expecting them. He was like, I'm going I'm to light these jokers up. As a matter of fact, they're angry. They're already weakened. Because the sun been lighting them up, the boils have been lighting them up, you know. So the enemy is telling them this will all be over and done with if we can go and defeat them. And so the enemy is saying Christ, Christ Jesus is going to meet us over here and we can put an end to your pain. All of the suffering that you were doing, we could put an end to that if we go into Jerusalem and if we defeat the one that's causing this, because he knows that Christ is going to show up. So the enemy deceives all of these people, 200, all the kings, these 10 kings that's going to give their authority to the, to the beast. He's going to use that authority to gather as many as he can to meet him into Jerusalem and then tell them they already got this hate for God. So they tell them, so the enemy is probably going to tell them, hey, look, the one that's got you in all of this pain and all of this affliction, it could all be over if we just go there and defeat them. And so the people like, you know, just stupid is and stupid does. They're going to follow him and they, it, it, they, they're going to march to their death. 200 million, right? So this is pretty interesting here. So God dries up the river. To make to because he's invited them to come. He's inviting them. Hey, come on. As a matter of fact, let me make it easy for you to get here. Let me dry this water up so that you can get here, right? So that's what's happening there. And God is expecting them, right? So, verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, which is the enemy himself. And then out of the mouth of the beast. And then out of the mouth of the false prophet. So this is the ungodly, unholy trinity. You got the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the dragon himself, right? And so remember, the, 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 the beast is considered the Antichrist. Somehow he dies and comes back. But when he comes back, it's Satan that commandeers his body, right? And so the people marvels after him because they're like he's, he's come back. Such is his kingdom. His kingdom was one from the past that was once in power. And now, just as the, the, this, this, this beast come back, so does his kingdom comes back. And so people are marveling after it, right? And so you'll see it's saying that there was, John saw what was their, their power of persuasion and, and what was doing these lying wonders. He saw three demonic spirits coming out uh, that looked like frogs coming out of the beast, coming out of the false prophet, and coming out of the dragon himself. He saw these three demonic uh, spirit beings that looked like frogs that were performing and persuading, right? 
performing lying wonders and persuading men to go and, 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 and you know, to go against God. OK, for they are the mirror. They are the spirits of devils or demons working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole earth to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. OK. Told you we have some good stuff to cover here. Now, Christ takes a moment to get in here and, and to, to, to remind us how important it is to keep our houses in order. How important it is to keep your lamps trimmed with oil, right? Because he comes in and look, look at what he says here. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garment, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So Christ is, is just in all in the midst of all that we're reading about what John himself has seen of what's going to happen. Christ takes a moment to get in here and to say, by the way, this is why it is important for you to keep your house in order. If you're slipping, put on some better shoes so that you can have better traction. If you're tired, don't take a break from me. Just lean on me to catch your rest so that you can move forward, right? If you're in the world, if you got one foot in the kingdom, one foot in the world, get that foot out of the world and get firmly planted in my kingdom. Because when I come, it's, it's going to happen quick. When I come, it's going to be fast, quick, and in a hurry. Don't be one of these ones that get so complacent that you miss me when I get here, right? You're, 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 you're locked out rather than shut in, right? Don't, don't have that happen to you. So he comes out to kind of put that, he comes in to kind of put that in, you know, oh, by the way, to kind of, you know, let us know that, a, a reminder, okay? So I thought that was pretty interesting. Verse 16, so he gathered them together into a place in the Hebrew tongue called Armageddon or Mount Megiddo. Mount Megiddo is, is Armageddon, okay? The place is called Armageddon or or. Uh, uh, translated as to say Mount Megiddo. And the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And look what happens after that. And there were voices and thunders and, and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men such such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great and the great city is talking about this babylon the great city was divided into three parts the city besides uh, or i'm sorry the cities of the nations fell and and great babylon came into remembrance before god to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath okay so once the seventh, uh, once once the angel poured out the seventh vial or the seventh bowl of God's wrath, there was a voice in heaven from the throne that said, "It is done," right? And then when that happened, a great shaking of the earth happened at that time, and and when and it said that the the shaking of the earth was so aggressive that from the time that man first stepped on, on onto the grounds of the earth. There had never been an earthquake like it before, right? And it, this was a massive earthquake. And the earthquake was so massive that it caused islands and mountains and nations to fall and, and, and to move out of the place and to divide and to crumble, right? That's how bad it, it was like. It was like God took a ball of him, took the, took the ball of the earth himself and began to just shake it, shake it. And everything up in there just broke apart and moved out of place. And the GPSs will no longer have exact coordinates because everything is moved out of place, right? It says the, the great city was divided into three parts. The city of the nations filled. Great Babylon came into remembrance. Look at verse 20. Every island fled because it was moved apart from the great shaking. Every island and mountains uh and the mountains were not found, right? And there fell upon men great hell out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. 
and men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hell. Okay? For the plague thereof was exceeding great. Now, when you look up the measurement of the talent, what that talent was, it's approximately 75, a little more than 75 pounds is, is, is what some are measuring. So the hell that's coming out of the sky, that's dropping upon men, you got 75, 75 plus pounds uh, of, of rocks or hell falling upon the head of men, right? And, and something falling from the atmosphere that heavy down, it's smashing all kind of stuff. It's, it's not too, it's not, what, you, what, what are you going to be in? What, what are you going to be in to try to protect you from the devastation of, of the size and the weight of the, of the hell that's falling on you? It's massive, right? So that's, and, and, and that was, that was it. That was, it. that was it. Now, the last thing that need to happen is, is Jesus show up on the scene and light this army up, right? Half of the work is already done because they are, I mean, not that Jesus couldn't take them. We can easily take them out. That's not even, that's, that's, that's not even the issue. These jokers is already lit up. They're already lit. They can't drink water. The water is bloody and poisoned. Um, they can't really go out because not unless you got you got something that's going to withstand the dropping of a 75-pound boulder from the heavens coming down upon you. You already lit. The sun is scorching you. You already have boils to which there is no cure for. Things are are, are in a bad state for you. And that whom you've chosen before Lord, the Lord is not able to save you, okay? All he's doing is convincing you to follow him to his destruction. I digress. We got a lot to cover. We want to try to cover uh, uh, chapter 17 here. So let's get to it. Revelation 17 and 1. There came one of the seven angels which had the seven bows. And he talked with me, saying unto me, come hither. And I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that setteth upon many waters. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth have, made drunk, have been made drunk by the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman set upon a scarlet beast full of the names of blasphemy and having seven heads and ten horns. Now, I kind of want to, I, I, I want to try to explain this as best as I can. Um, the, this harlot, this woman, this prostitute that's setting upon the beast is this religious slash political system that has been carried out throughout the ages, going all the way back to Egypt right? It's mainly, the origin of it is mainly in Babylon. But prior to Babylon, Egypt had all of these uh, uh, idols, but God judged Egypt and let them know that yo, <laughs> your idols, I'm the only wise true God. So that being said, the origin of all this is really was there in Babylon because God had already showed Egypt that he was the only wise true God. So going all the way back to, I clarify myself, going all the way back to Babylon, that's the origin of this religious slash political system. And this system has carried on throughout the ages. So going, so going back to Babel, going back to Babylonia, the, going back in the time of the Babylonians, remember Nimrod was trying to encourage the people to build the tower, right? And he was trying to lord over the people. And he was telling the people, you don't need God, you have me. And, and to keep God from, from, to keep him from doing what he had already done with the flood, let's build this tower, you know? And then once we build it high enough, let's just shoot some arrows into there to see if we can take him out, right? 
and the people followed after him. So that and, and he wanted to be their God, right? Nimrod wanted to be their God. So that political system, political and religious system that was there in Babylon, that they don't need God, that they're gods all by themselves and, and look at what we can do without God. And, and, and men is made to worship, but someone got up in there, that being the enemy, and, 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 de and what was meant for God, he had his figures to receive that worship, right? He had his people, right? Have them lording over you. Well, God now judges that. That whole system that was that was there, God, it, it survived over the course of, of, of centuries. And God finally puts an end to it because it lived all of this time. So when we read about this lady on the har this this harlot on the beast, the lady is this Babylonian system that was uh, based that was based in politics and religion itself. It was infused politics and religion, and it was designed to forsake God. And, 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 and if, as long as you forsake God and, and you become part of this system, you can benefit from it. We don't need God is what the system was saying. We have ourselves, right? Now, that's the, har that's the harlot. That's, it's this Babylonian system. The beast that she sets on is the Antichrist, okay? So follow me. The Babylonian system is the harlot. The beast that the harlot sets on is the Antichrist. So I want you to have that information, okay? Because you're going to need that going forward, okay? So it gives you an understanding. It says that the whole world, if we read part, if we read verse one, it lets you know the whole world was in on it. There came one of the seven angels, which had the seven bowls and talk with me saying, come hither and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great horde that sits on many waters. Many waters are all the papal tongues and nations that, that bought in to, to, to what she was selling, this political and religious system, okay? F whom the kings of the earth have committed fornications and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication because they forsook God and they got into the system. Man is made to worship. You can turn your back on God, but you still need to worship something because there is a need there. That's you were designed to do so. You were designed to worship God, but the enemy gets up in there to distract and 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 to confuse you as to who your worship should belong to. Okay. So verse three. So he carried me away in the spirit in the wilderness, and I saw a woman set upon the scarlet beast, full of the names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns. The seven heads and ten horns is the beast that she sits on. Okay, it's this beast. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. So it's full of idolatry. It's full of the riches, that the, the, the wealth and the riches that she had gotten uh, she's gotten it through perversions um, and, and then the, the idols that, that over the course of time, all the idols that the people begin to worship, false these, these idols and various things, idolatry. It's talking about when it says fornication and, idolatry, uh, and uh, adultery, it's talking about uh, uh, her being uh, a harlot in a sense. It's talking about the way she was spiritually that she she didn't go towards God. She went towards the world. She went towards the enemy himself, right? And and the things of that sense. So I need you to follow me. I'm, I'm going to try to keep as much commentary out so that I don't confuse you as to what's going on here. Okay, so now here we are. So let's reread verse three. So he carried me in the spirit and into the wilderness, and I saw a woman set on the scarlet beast full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and the scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of the abominations of, filthy, of the filthiness of her fornication. Now, we really get into some interesting stuff here. 
and upon her and upon her forehead was the name written mystery babylon the great the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth okay so that's what's on her forehead that's the name remember what i said we look at it as a woman that's on the beast but we're looking when you look at it as the woman you have to understand that it's a, it's talking about this religious slash political system that that prostit that calls the world to be in prostitution sleeping with the world if you will you know turning their attention from god to the things of the earth right and i saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So when it said drunken with the blood of the saints, the system attacked the children of God. This religious and political system began to attack the children of God. It began to slay them, kill them, right? Because the children of God begins to speak the truth. Remember what John did? Remember what John did when he, uh, John the Baptist, Remember when he spoke against Herod for, for having his, his brother's wife, right? That's that kind of, of that's, that's, that's that kind of uh, outspoken when you speak the truth. And what, what happened? They end up taking, they end up uh, uh, cutting his head off, right? The, 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 the stepdaughter of, of Herod begins to, to dance sensually for him and his, and his boys. And he was like, you can have, whatever you want up to the half of my kingdom. And she, she told her mother what, 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 uh, 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 what Herod had promised her. And the mother was like, you know, tell him to give you the head of John the Baptist because John insulted them by speaking truth. He let them know you can't be with, you can't be with him and neither should he be with you. You know, he tell John the Baptist, tell Herod, that's your brother's wife. You can't be with your brother's wife. And you can't be with your husband's brother. You can't do that. And they imprisoned John for saying that. And so they killed him. So that's an example <coughs> of how that, that system, that adulterous system, everything is okay. Everything that's, that God has spoke against this political slash religious system gives a stamp of approval as to say you should be doing this, right? But I digress. That's just one example. So it says the blood of the saints with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So it, it's talking about how they killed the children of the most high God. Going on, verse 7. And the angel said unto me, wherefore didst thou marvel? He says, I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carrieth her, which had the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundations of the world when they when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Now we've talked in our in our last chapter, in the chapter we just got done reading, chapter 16, we talked about those that were appointed to the wrath of God. And as the angel is telling John here, those that are captivated by the beast, those are whose names are not written in the book of life. Those are the ones that are appointed to the wrath of God. Okay? And, it, and then it says in verse 8, the beast that thou saw that was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. At some point in time, the beast was in power, right? And then all of a sudden it was, it was killed. It had a deadly wound on his head. But then all of a sudden it comes back. And remember when I told you when it comes back, it's, it's Satan that comes into the beast. So it comes originally out of the bottomless pit. It comes from hell, right? And then when it comes out of hell, it's going back into perdition, meaning that God is going to take Satan himself and, and, and put him into perdition and he'll be chained for a thousand years. And the Antichrist himself 
she'll be locked up. She, he's going into perdition, okay? So that's what the verse is saying here. The beast that thou sawest, that was, and it's not because at some point in time it died, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. So it's coming out of hell to rule, but then when, it's, when it rules for a short time, it's gone, okay? Such is the kingdom itself. The kingdom that once was in power, then it's no longer in power, but then all of a sudden the kingdom itself comes back into power. Okay, so we got a lot to talk about there, but we but but I'll digress and, and we'll continue to read because the scripture began to open up for us. So now we're down at verse nine. And there and here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sets. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Now, this, these seven mountains, as it says, are seven kings or seven kingdoms. So let's look at the seven kingdoms because we can actually name them off. Most people say this is talking about Rome because Rome sets on seven hills. And I'll give you that. Remember, the scripture begins to talk about um not only does it mention the king, but it also mentions the kingdom, if you will. So it mentions the king and the kingdom. Now, when we look at the seven kingdoms, start from Egypt. Egypt is one. Assyria is two. Babylon is three. Medes and Persian, that's four. Greece is five. Rome is six. Those are six kingdoms, right? <coughs> but then all of a sudden it says Rome, what, which, which used to be in charge, in control, comes back into power. It comes back in. It resurrects itself. Just like the king, that particular king, the, this Antichrist, was once in power and then dies and then comes back into power, such as the kingdom does too. It comes back into power. And so one is thinking that it has to be like a Rome, but what's Rome today? Rome could be America. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just spitballing. I'm not, I don't know. But this kingdom comes back into power. Okay. And then as the kingdom was once dead and comes back into power, such as the Antichrist, which is going to be once dead and then comes back. That's what causes the people to marvel because they're in awe at how he's back into power, right? It's, they're in awe over that. So hopefully you have that understanding there. As it says, the, 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 it sets on the seven mountains. It says the seven, what does it say? Here, the seven, uh, um, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, okay? And, and it's, saying, it's, it's describing the kingdom that it, that it, was, that it come from, that it originated from. All of these various kingdoms, these satanic kingdoms from the, from the course of time until now, and we've already named them off. Well, again, Egypt, Syria, Babylon, uh, Medes, Persia, Greece, Rome, and then a resurrection of Rome itself. Okay, so that's seven right there. Okay. Now, verse 11, now, verse 10, rather. There are seven kings. Five are fallen. So what are the five that are fallen? Seven kings or seven kingdoms? We know that Egypt is gone. We know that, that Assyria is gone. We know that Babylon is gone. We know that Persia is gone. And then we know that Greece is gone. So five are already fallen. And one is. So at the time that John was, was, was being told to write this, it said one is. Which is the one? The number six is Rome. Rome was the one that was in power at the time that John was, was having to write this. And that's what the angel is telling them. There are seven kings or seven kingdoms. Five of them are fallen. 
One is, which happens to be Rome at that time that this was being written. And the other is not yet to come because it's got to be resurrected. And when it come, he must continue for a short space. So remember, during the tribulation period, it's going to come back into power. During the tribulation period, this Roman Empire that ruled is expected to come back into power. These are all the kingdoms that came against the Jews. Okay. And then at some point in time, it's going to come back into power. And it says it's going to be for a short time for three and a half years during the tribulation period, three and a half years. So, and when it cometh, it must continue for a short space, which is three and a half years during the tribulation period. Now, verse 11. And the beast that was, and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seventh, and goeth into perdition. Now, here's the way we explain this verse here. Pretty interesting. Remember when we said that the Antichrist is going to end up dying. And, and being resurrected. But when he comes back. Now, now he's not going to be resurrected. In the sense that, that, that God did. Uh, uh, how Jesus was bringing people back. And how God brought Jesus back. He's not going to be resurrected into that sense. What it is. Is that the enemy himself. The dragon. Is going to take over the body. Of the Antichrist. Thus making him the eighth king. He is going. And then. That's what makes him do away with what was happening before with the whole Babylonian system because he wants to be revered. He wants to be worshipped. So that that's gives you an understanding of this verse here. The beast that was and is not, it's, when it says the beast, is talking about the Antichrist. The beast that was, he was alive, and then is not, meaning he died. Even he is the eighth, so he comes back. And when he comes back, the enemy assumes his vessel. But the enemy don't want things the way it was before. He don't want this whole Babylonian system. He wants to be worshipped. Okay? So he, so he is of the seventh. And he himself goes into perdition. So when the time comes, he get locked up. He get locked up. Now, verse 12. The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as of yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. So that three and a half years that the, that, that the beast rules, he's going to have these, these ten powerful kings of the earth. They're going to be federate. They're going to be united. They're going to ring with him, and they'll give what, what, whatever new districting has happened um, from wars and rumors of wars, uh, maybe there is a one nation. No matter what has happened, there seems to be ten kings that begins to rule over the planet, over all the nation states. And then these ten kings give their a power and authority to the beast himself, okay, which we know to be the dragon. Okay. Verse 13: These have one mind, and they shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So they're confederate, they're unified, and they're all in, in agreement that they're going to, to delegate all their nation's power to the, to the beast. These shall make war with the lamb. This is why the, this is why the water, <laughs> the, the water, the U, Euphrates River dries up, right? They're going to, they've been convinced by these frogs that came out of the mouths of the dragon, the false prophet, and the beast, and they went and, and spoke, they went and persuaded these ten kings of the earth to go to make war with the lamb because they expect him coming. They said, we need to go to Jerusalem. You know, we need to go, we need to go cross over the Euphrates and, and take care of the one that's brought this destruction and pain upon us. We need to go take care of him. So these shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings. Hallelujah. Glory. And they that are with him are called, and they are chosen, and they are faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples, multitudes, 
and nations and tongues. So the whole world was in on it. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make war, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So when the enemy, when the dragon himself assumes the body of the uh, uh, of the beast, then he is not going to want the these idols taking his praise and his worship. He is not going to want Confucius and Muhammad and 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 all the others. He don't. He's not going to want that. He's going to want his worship himself. And he, he, he's going to demand it, right? So all of the other uh, uh, avenues of faith that people go to outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, outside of God Almighty, all of the others that they have concocted, the enemy is not, he's going to do away with all that. That's, that represents the political and religious system. He is not going to want that. And he is going to convince these kings to tell their people to do away with that. He wants to be worshipped. Okay. For God has put it in their heart. To fulfill his will. And to agree. And give their kingdom unto the beast. Until the words of God. Shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest. Is that great city. Which reigneth over the kings of the earth. That's Babylon. That, that's that religious system. That. Even Rome, the, the practice, the, the, the various things that the, the Rome has, the, the different idols and various things that they, sh the, the idols that Rome, all that stuff goes back to the Babylonian times. And, and all that's going to be done away with, the enemy is going to demand it. So that's going to take care of our lesson for today. I know I ran a little long, but I wanted you to have it. Uh, God wanted you to receive it, and uh, we bless him for it. Eternal God, I thank you for the opportunity to preach your word, to teach your word, to declare your truths, to not only give understanding, but to have received understanding of your word. You are a generous God, and you're always preparing. You're always fortifying us. For this, Lord God, we thank you in Jesus' name. Have your way in this Bible study. Continue to call the masses out of darkness that we can be identified as those that are called and those that are faithful. Help us to lay aside the weight of sin that so easily beset us. Help us to repent that we continue to be with you and not be those that have been appointed to God's wrath. God, I thank you for your grace and your mercies and your truths. I thank you for your love of us. And I thank you, Father, that you have created, you have created us, you have made us, and you have saved us, that we may live and reign forever with you through, Je through Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Go with me quickly uh, to Matthew 11. I'll read through these very quick. This is the path. You can always find, uh, if you go to our website, you can always find the path laid out for you to obtain the gift of salvation. We've read about what's going to happen to those that walk contrary to the ordinances and the precepts of God, those that are in con contradiction of his righteousness, the fate that will befall them. Here is how, here's how you are saved from that. It starts with Jesus Christ offering you an invitation to be saved. He says, come unto me. This is Matthew chapter 11, beginning at verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The one thing you got to understand is 
he he has this he has the best life that he wants to give you he's got your he's got your interests at heart that he wants you to come and join him be a part of the family come and be partakers of his kingdom right and then if he says take and learn he says learn of me forget what they've been saying what the world has been saying about me you try me for yourself and come and learn of me and what and what you'll find out is how is how i have your best interests at heart you'll find that out that i'm for you before i'm against you you'll find that out but you but when you come to him you have to turn away from the world because it's not going to work in the kingdom of God. Remember, we spent the, the, better, the better part of an hour and a half talking about how the old world is going to fade away and God is ushering in the new world. He's ushering in the new heaven and the new earth and the old is going to be done away with. And so now is the time for us to prepare for what will be. And Christ is offering us, the Messiah, is Emmanuel, he is offering that platform, that bridge of transition and change unto us. Amen? Go with me to Romans chapter 11, or chap Romans, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. Romans 10 verses 9 through 13. This is how you accept Jesus as Lord. This is how you accept his invitation. You first turn away from the world because when he says, come unto me, that means leave the world behind and come to me. Now you commit to making him Lord of your life. Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. You know how you give your wedding vows. You say, do, the, the man of God will say, do you take this man or do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded husband or your lawfully wedded wife? And you say, I do, right? Well, this is what you're saying to Jesus, that if thou shalt confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus, you're saying, I do make you Lord of my life. That's what you're doing. I make you Lord of my life. I commit to marrying you and to obeying you, okay? And shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It's factoring in confession and faith. That you believe, you believe that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God that laid down his life for us and was and was brought back to life after three days and three nights, and is alive forevermore. And he is the one that will reign and rule in the millennium. The safekeeping of our souls have been placed in his hands, amen? And if you believe it, and you confess that he is Lord, you are saved. What are you being saved from? We just covered that. We just covered that. That's, you're being saved from the wrath of God that's going to fall upon the whole, the whole world, amen? I will go back and reference the Gospel of John chapter 3 and 36, but I want you to do it. It's basically saying what we've already said. Your, re your rejection of, your rebellion against God and your rejection of his only begotten son. And, and that's the wrath. But if you take this path, you enjoy, you, 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 uh, excuse me. If you take this path, you're removed from the wrath that's going to come upon the earth. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And so there's good and bad. That as God would punish the children of Israel, he would punish his children that are Gentiles. And the good is that a God was saving his children, the Jews. He's also looking to save us, the Gentiles. So there's no difference with God when it comes to 
salvation being offered between the Jews and the Gentiles. There's no difference when it comes to that. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is going to save you. He promises to do that. But you have to put yourself in position to be saved by turning away from your sins. That's repentance. By confessing Jesus as Lord. Okay? Calling upon him and letting him know that I make you Lord of my life. Quickly go with me to 1 John chapter 1 verses 8 through 10. 1 John chapter 1 verses 8 through 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. This is letting you know this is part of that path. When Christ says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. This is what it means to come to him, turning away from your sins and then let God know, let him know through prayer what it is that you repented of so that it never gets brought up again. God even takes it out of the enemy because the enemy is the accuser of the brethren. At, at this time, he has, he has permission to go to the throne of God to accuse us right there at the throne. But the time is going to come to where he's going to be put into the pit. But until he's put into the pit, those things that you've been forgiven of and that the blood of the lamb has washed you clean of, God doesn't give the enemy permission to, to bring it up because God himself is not trying to hear about it. And as long as you turned away from it, you disarm the enemy. You take away his argument against you. That's, that's the bottom line. But if you're still living in your sin, then the enemy is constantly bringing it up because he wants God to penalize you. He wants God to turn him loose on you. Okay? And so once you do what you're supposed to and you start walking right with God, then the enemy has to, he has to get up off of you. He can't even bring a case against you. He could try to make one, but he can't bring one. He can try to tempt you, but as long as you're covered in the armor of God and you resist him, he has nothing to complain about at the throne of God. Amen? If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. If you're not honest about what's broken about you, then you can't be saved. If you live in deceit and dishonesty, there's nothing that the word can do for you. Amen? Lastly, and quickly, go with me to Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 47. Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 47. And I'll just read through this. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know surely that God had made that same Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. And what Peter is saying here is that Surely those that have gathered here in this upper room on this particular day of Pentecost, that's the backdrop of what's going on here. Surely those that are here, it's hard to believe that any of you would have taken nails and drive them through the hands of Jesus, crucifying them on the cross, taking nails and driving them through the feet as he was crucified on the cross. But your lifestyle, those unrepented sins, those sins that you haven't repented of, that, that makes you just as guilty as those that had done that to him. Okay, you may say, I, I, I'm not doing all those things. But sin in your life, period, makes you just as guilty, guilty as those that had nailed Jesus to the cross. Now, when they heard this, they were convicted or they were pricked in their heart. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and, bro men and brethren, what shall we do? What can we do to get our life in order? When God convicts us, he's letting us know that there's something amiss within our lives and it's going to cost us if we don't get those things reconciled between him and ourselves. If we don't do our part to, to get a handle on that stuff, it's going to cost us, right? And God is convicting you to try to move you to take action, okay? 
So don't disregard those convictions. God got, he has that there for a reason. And that means that he hasn't given up on you. When he convicts you, it's because he hasn't given up on you. So stop giving up on yourself. Do something about what's happening with your situation. Take hold of it before God turns you over. You don't want him to turn you over. Amen. When I say turn you over, turn you over to the enemy or turn you over to yourself. That's the worst that he can do to you. So Peter says, repent, turn away from your sins first and foremost. Then Peter gives us the instruction, be ye baptized, you know, in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the, for the remission of sins. Now, let's talk about the ceremony of baptism. Christ was nailed to the cross, laying down his life, meaning that he died on the cross, taken down off the cross, and laid to rest in the tomb. He was laid to rest in a tomb, remember he was dead, for three days and for three nights he laid to rest. After three days and three nights he was brought back to life. Laid to rest, brought back to life. Okay. When we go through the ceremony of baptism, we are uh, some fully submerged in the water. That represents us being buried in Christ Jesus. Okay. When we go down into the water, being fully submerged, we are buried in Jesus Christ. When we come up out of the water, we are resurrected in Jesus Christ. Your old man goes down, your new man comes up, all of your sins are washed away. You remember in our Bible study, we talked about God getting rid of the old to make room for the new. This is the process of you inheriting the new, your name being counted amongst those in the Lamb's Book of Life. This is that process. Your old man has to be done and away with. Your new man has to come forth so that you can take part in the new world uh, uh, with the kingdom of God. Amen. That starts now. Your training of inheriting that which is to come starts now. But the old man has to go down. The new man has to come up. Amen. So that's the ceremony of baptism. That's why we do it. We're told to do it. And I've given you the reason of why we go through it so that your old man can go down and your new man can come up and all of your sins can be washed away. So make sure you get it done. Amen. Um, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. God puts his spirit inside of us to seal us up. We're the only ones that can break the seal. People contend with that statement that I make. But God is a God of free will. And if you don't want to be saved no more. You can you just be like, God, I'm tired of it. I'm going to do what I want to do. That's you breaking the seal. OK, that's the only way that, that the, the enemy don't have the, the the enemy don't have the power or authority to break your seal. He can tempt you to get you to break your own seal. You're sealed up. Imagine uh, you're being put in an envelope and that envelope is sealed up. Nobody has the authority to to break that seal open. But the Lamb of God. And you, you can break that seal by saying, I don't want to be saved no more. I don't want to live according. To, and you go on about your life and you're perish with the rest. Amen. The, the enemy don't have all he can do is tempt you to make you try to do it against yourself. So that's why God gives us his spirit so that he can be inside of us. His spirit is constantly uh, uh, transforming us on the inside out giving you a hunger and a thirst of righteousness, making you, moving you towards prayer, uh, uh, getting into the doctrine of, of the word of God. You know, it's moving you towards those holy and godly things that when you were in, as a natural man, you thought these things were foolish. Now, because you're spiritual, having received the spirit of God and you're spiritual, these things are not are not foolish to you any longer. For the promises unto you and to your children and to those that are far off, even as many as the Lord God shall call. God is always trying to call us out of darkness, but it's up to us if we're willing to come into the light that he's that he offers us. He's always the invitation is always there, but it's up to you if you're going to accept it. And it don't matter where you come from or what you or what you've done. What matters is what you're willing to do at this point. 
And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. That applies to us today. Save yourselves from this crooked or perverse generation. That applies to us. That's what we when reading about in Isaiah, about those that didn't separate themselves, those that didn't call upon Jesus Christ to be Lord. Amen? And that's what, that's what Peter is constantly telling us. We've got to take this thing seriously. Then they that gladly received the word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And now, and here is another path set before us how to grow stronger and closer to God. They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in breaking of bread and in prayers. God keeps, whatever God used to get you saved, whether it's Bible study, uh, you, 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 you started following a friend to the place of worship and, and you received, you, you started receiving some truth. Whatever God has done to get you on the path to salvation, it takes a, a practice and a continuation of those things to keep you getting stronger. It takes a daily dose or, or a regimen of those same activities to not only get you stronger, but to see you to the end. Once you start pulling back on those things, then you're in danger of falling back. And once you're in, da once you're, you're in danger of stopping, and from stopping, you're in danger of falling back, which, in, which is backsliding. So don't stop doing those things that got you to where you are. It, you, it takes a continuation of that, a regimen of that to keep you moving forward. Amen? Uh, verse 43, fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles and all that believed were, com were together and had all things common. This is the brotherhood. It's talking about the brotherhood. They sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with God all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved God we take this opportunity to thank you for the path of salvation for the gift of life the gift of eternal life with you and with Jesus who is Christ father I thank you also for calling all of us out of darkness and giving us an opportunity to take hold of that light Father, those that have accepted the call, those that have accepted the invitation, we pray for them, that you help them to remain repentant. Father, that they accept Jesus as Lord and that they become sons and daughters of God and not return back to their former lust. We pray for them, Father, that you would place them in places of worship, Father, to where they can not only worship you, but magnify Jesus and edify our brothers and sisters. We pray that not only you fill them with the Spirit of God, but that you also give them an understanding of their gifts and callings and use them for the sake of your glory. It's our petition for those whom you've called out of darkness and have answered the call. Father, I thank you for increasing the size of our family and keeping the door open for us to become citizens of the kingdom of God. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name, and we pray. Amen. Uh, this is Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. If you have any unrepented sin in your life, you won't be able to take advantage of these blessings. Remember, sin brings about curses. Obedience brings about your blessings, right? And so this is a blessing. The word bless is littered all in this, right? But you can't let curses, you know, be a soldier at the gate uh, warding off your blessings, you know, because you, you got sin in the gate. So curses is standing outside of the gate, may, you know, bombarding any blessings that would otherwise enter in. So you got to do away with, you got to get rid of, the, the, the 
the sins in your life so that you can dismiss the curses that are standing guard. Uh, I watch, my wife and I, lately we've been watching The Lord of the Rings. I don't remember, there's three of them, man. <laughs> and if you ever go back and watch those, I mean, those like, if you watch all three of them, that's a good 12 hours, right? But they're very, if they, they really do have such a spiritual meaning to it. I don't remember which one, if it's the first or the second or the third, but there was a king. And this king had this, this, um, like his 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 hand his his right hand person had put some kind of spell over him and so the king couldn't receive any counsel he was like a zombie he couldn't rule he he couldn't give good orders he couldn't call out good things he couldn't he couldn't acknowledge things all he can do was be a servant to the to darkness because his right hand person that didn't have his best interests at heart had a spell over him. It's similar to having it's similar to having sin in your life. And that sin is stopping any goodness from coming at you. Do you see what I'm saying? It's deflecting any goodness from coming at you. Right? And and then outside of the of the gates, it's got curses reinforcing. The, the entrance to make sure blessings can't come in. That's how significant it is. So you got to make sure that you get sins out of your life so that you can fully embrace what God is trying to give you. Amen. Remember, it's a God of free will. So he is, he, he respects the fact that you choose curses over blessings. He respects that. Okay. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. I loose this on you that you would receive it in Jesus' name, that you prosper, that you're transformed, and that you're anchored down in the will of God, and that you place not only God but his kingdom first, always at all, and at all times, that you yourself shall prosper. Receive the blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. I thank you for your, your prayers and your proceeds and your support of the ministry. I love you. My wife and I, our family, we love you. And thank you for allowing us to be a part of your Bible study.